right now the looming fiscal cliff. We're going to be joined by Congressman Charlie Rangel, who tells us if he thinks D.C. will get its act together before it's too late. And next, under pressure. Susan Rice feeling the heat, but is this going to backfire on GOP or pushing hard against the U.N. ambassador? And later, it's turkey time. we got some tips for surviving Thanksgiving with the family. Good evening and welcome to RFL. I'm Richard French and thanks so much Doesn't for joining us how many this times Wednesday, I do that one. November 21st. A lot to get to in the next 60 minutes, including politics, post-storm recovery, and even a little pumpkin pie. But we begin with a looming fiscal cliff. Congressman Charlie Rangel, he joins us now for the inside scoop on how negotiations are going, what else to expect from D.C. this coming legislative year. Congressman Rangel, thank you for the time. Okay, happy holidays. You too. Uh, fiscal cliff here. Um, do you get the sense we're going to get something done before the end of the year? Continuation? Or does the president call the bluff and go over the cliff? Well, we'll get something done. We're not going over the cliff. This fiscal cliff and sequestration was a creation of a nightmare that's not going to happen. The question really is, are we going to take advantage of this crisis and move on to do something, at least the beginning of reforming the tax code? And if we're going to look at entitlements, look at it in a way that doesn't do harm to our agent and our sick and those that are totally dependent on it. The major thing we have to overcome is the question of revenue. You can't reduce spending just by cutting. You have to be able to decrease the deficit by increasing revenues. Now, the Republicans have said that you can do it without raising the rates on the top 2%. And it seems as though that is something that so far, at least semantically, we haven't overcome. I say if they can do it, put it on the table. Mathematically, it cannot be done. You've got to increase the rates on the top 2%. You read the tea leaves, though. It does seem that they're open to some revenue increases, whether it's rates or revenue, uh, it seems that they'll play ball here and they're going to raise taxes to some degree, don't you think? Let me make it clear. Raising revenue, what they're talking about is closing taps, loopholes, unfair preferential treatment that are giving to the rich and multinational corporations. So it's really no profile and courage when you say you're going to raise revenue. What you're saying is you're not going to touch the tax rate. But for those that, are, those that are getting this unfair preferential treatment, they are now willing to say they, they're going to close it. Do you think the public's going to be pleasantly surprised at how much actually gets done in this second term of the president? It seems that, forget about mandates or whatever, it's in the Republican self-interest to do immigration reform, among other things here. You think um, you're going to have a very active Congress in the next couple of years? Well, the public rightly has been critical of the Congress, but, you know, this issue is not a Democrat and Republican issue any longer. It's an issue about the economic uh, survival of our great country. And again, you know, we talk about entitlements like it's a dirty word. Just because Republicans have been against Social Security, against Medicaid, against Medicare, and believe the government should be out of all of these things, and that the private sector should take care of it. Well, you know, if you didn't look at it as an entitlement, but you looked at it, we're talking about providing health care to the very poor. We're talking about providing health care uh, to the, to the age at which they have paid into a fund to do it. We're talking about Social Security. So where are the churches, the synagogues, the Mormons, the Muslims? These are really biblical and spiritual issues. How does a nation take care of the most vulnerable? And so it's easy to be critical of the Congress, but sometimes you, you take what you get. And if you don't, you, you know, you can hear the churches when it comes to same-sex marriage. And that's what they're supposed to do. But what about the poor, the vulnerable? What about the undeclared wars that cost us trillions of dollars? I say this, these issues are important enough that you shouldn't just leave it to Democrats and Republicans. You should make certain that there's a national movement. The election is over. Let's deal with the issues. Well, one of the issues right now in front of them is what to do with Susan Rice if, in fact, uh, she is nominated uh, to replace outgoing Hillary Clinton at state. Um, if her name came up, you already have a whole bunch of your colleagues in the House saying that they would oppose her nomination, even though the House, as we know, won't vote on it. 
um, one of your colleagues, Congressman Clyburn, said that there was some racial code words that were being discussed with Susan Rice. Is opposition to her, you think, in part because of the color of her skin? Well, the, the racist undertones that, that we have in this country, I think that you see it in immigration, you see it in a variety of things, but uh, I would not call it that at this point because I think her credibility, her background, and her experience are so overwhelmingly positive that even those people like McCain and Graham that made these unfair remarks are going to review it and they're going to back off and then we'll take another look at her as a potential candidate for Secretary of State. But you know, she's a woman, she's black, and she looked vulnerable. But when it's all over, no one said that she went beyond influencing the American people except with a statement that the intelligence uh, community gave to her. And she read what they gave to her and no one challenges that. Now, if they want to find out what changes were made from the original CIA report before it got to her, let's talk about that. But the mere fact that we're discussing her shows this is totally, totally unfair. I think we should put this behind us. I think that those that were asking uh, for her apology should start figuring out how they are going to apologize by d trying to damage the reputation of this woman. You know, I saw a headline today and I thought of you. Um, we have the fewest amount of veterans in Congress since the 1940s. And for people who don't know, you're a decorated vet yourself from Korea. Um, can you tell the difference since you've been in Congress from when you first got into now, uh, the lack of the people that wore a uniform with all the questions of what our role involvements are abroad, but yet they didn't put a uniform on themselves? You bet your life. You know, anytime you find people who haven't even belonged to the Boy Scouts talking about sending troops into areas that we have not declared war on, if you take a look at what has happened in Vietnam, uh, uh, even as far back as Korea, if you take a look at, at how we managed to get involved in Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, these things were oil, not national security. And the American people never gave permission for any president, Republican or Democrat, to get involved here. And what are they talking about? It's not members of Congress families that's going to be uh, drafted because we don't have a draft. But I tell you this, we will not be involved in so many ground troop activities if people who will support this in the Congress thought for one minute that we were talking about their family, their friends, and their community. Hey, Congressman, I appreciate the time as always, and you have yourself a nice Thanksgiving. You too, and your family and your loved ones. Thank you. All right, everybody. We're going to be right back here. More RFL right after this quick break.